Welcome to Meme Free Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. I'm Jenna Million. And this is a podcast where we challenge sexism in the music industry and empower fangirls. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And if you stick around long enough, we'll also let you in on some new music the girls are already crazy about. And this is just your friendly reminder that if you want bonus episodes or bonus access to Name 3 Songs, you can come join us over at Patreon at patreon.com slash Name 3 Songs. And with that being said, Jenna, would you like to tell everybody what we're talking about today? I would love the honor. Today we're talking about representation of Asian Americans in the American music market specifically. And this is something that Again, it's been on our bucket list for a while. It's one of those topics, takes a lot of research, and boy, did we learn a lot today. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation. Yeah, I think that this is definitely one of the more important topics that we've taken on to discuss on this podcast, because I think it's something that is hard to understand, especially as white people, because a lot of the people we're going to talk about today fit within that American idea of ethnic ambiguity where people have not really acknowledged the Asian-ness behind the artist. And so there's just a lot of layers to this discussion. And because there are so many layers to it, and because there's a lot of nuance to think about when it comes to talking about a topic like this, we do have on a very special guest who's one of my very close personal friends. So Jenna, can you introduce everybody to Emily? Emily Tan is a freelance writer and photographer based in Brooklyn, New York. Her work has appeared in various sites, including Village Voice, Yahoo News, MySpace, AOL, NPR, NBC Asian America, and Spin. She's also released a -a bookazine on BTS and is currently working on one about Harry Styles. Can you name a more perfect guest? (laughs) How fitting. (laughs) We couldn't have found a more perfect person to be on this podcast or this episode. So without further ado, Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So since today we're talking about Asian American representation in music and specifically speaking from the American perspective of things, I kind of wanted everyone to go around and give some of their thoughts on preconceived ideas or things that you saw growing up of what Asian American representation was specifically like within the musical context. I would say growing up, there wasn't any. I grew up in a neighborhood which was mostly like Italian, Polish, and Irish. So any kind of Filipino music was what my parents listened to in the Philippines. And like in America, I guess the only person I ever knew was Yoko Ono, but I think I was like too young to even make the association that we were from the same continent, like when I was little. So like it wasn't really there. And then as a kid, something that a lot of my Asian friends and I have grown up with is like, you if you learn music, it's always classical. So we'd have yeah. to either learn the piano or the violin. And I played the piano, not well, but yeah, it was barely any. And it wasn't until like maybe high school or into college that I started seeing a little bit more, but it was still kind of unknown or they're just part of bands, but they were never like the front person. I guess like when you got to college and like, was it very obvious to you there was no representation? And I guess, I don't know, kind of like as you got older, how did your reactions around this evolve? It was really interesting because I think that growing up where my parents came over here from Asia, it was almost like you're coming into the U.S. So like then everything is the U.S. And there is this idea that America, I guess, kind of like equals white or black and that's it. So like for me, it's like, I guess growing up, I was like, okay, well, these are Americans. This is what Americans look like. And so these are the artists that we would see. So I never really kind of craved that I think growing up because there was never anyone to kind of change the idea and like in the Philippines a lot of especially pop and R&B singers they're super into like covering all of the pop and R&B songs here so it's almost like that association but again it was never like their original songs like there's a genre called original Filipino music and that's a genre because they cover so much American music so it was like really weird and it wasn't until I think I remember my friend in high school introduced me to this artist named Bik Runga and she sang the song called Sway. It was like in the early 2000s ish, super acoustic. And then that's my introduction into like Asian American music, I think, because there were a lot of artists that were just kind of breaking in, but a lot of them had an acoustic guitar and would either do covers 
then like going to try to do their own songs so that I think that was like it but like when it came to like you know rock music or indie or any of that like I was like I guess this is what we do like that's kind of like how it became for me that's such an interesting point that I never would have even thought of is like your parents being so were your parents first generation immigrants to America Mm mm-hmm yeah so like your mindset was was like Americans look a certain way because your parents weren't American and you were but I guess like in that perspective you're like no like my parents aren't so maybe I'm not and seeing artists look the way that you assume Americans are supposed to look you're not being like oh I'm not being represented because I'm being represented in the Philippines where I'm from and so I feel like that's something that people don't think about in regards to like if your parents are first generation you're like oh well they're from another country they're not from America so American music being like all white and black makes sense because in your mind that's what is in America but I feel like that is the problem and something that in doing research for this I was thinking about a lot is it's like the quote-unquote expected norm of music coming out of America is it's like there are white people and there are black people and they both for like a very long time kind of quote-unquote stayed in their lane for the genres of music that they played and then as more people from Mexico were immigrating to America we started to see more Hispanic Latina people in music and then that became normal for people to see like people that looked like that and then it's like but what else is there even though Asians have been here for such a long time from like all different parts of Asia it's just so interesting to think of like from that perspective because I think for a lot of people they wouldn't ever think like that because they're not like oh well (laughs) it's like you are American though but I can see like that makes a lot of sense and that that just like kind of blew my mind (laughs) yeah I mean I think one thing that's interesting and I only realized it when I moved to the UK was that coming from the US and being born in the US they saw me as American Mm -hmm. but like the entire time I've grown up and like as an adult now I will identify myself as Mm Filipino-American and they were just like but you're not Filipino because you're not from the Philippines and I'm like no but because I don't look a certain way I'm not just American in America And and I think that was the thing that, to your point of, like, how there is this norm as far as, like, what American artists look like, that I think I didn't really grapple with until, like, I went to college and started learning about the history of Asian Americans during that time. Because when I was little, like, I remember in preschool, I remember at home I was Filipino because they didn't really speak English. So, like, I learned the language and dialect. And then, like, when I went to preschool, I saw myself as white because all my classmates were white. And they never, like, questioned me. I've read essays of people being questioned for what they look like, but I think because they were just like, oh, well, she's like us. So there was never like that I don't see color kind of conversation, I guess, when I was little. But then I would switch gears right away and like move into the other direction. And I think that's kind of why I never really looked for Asian artists as an adult because when you think of from a music history like pop music context right my mom was super into Whitney Houston and Roberta Flack and Diana Ross and like Paul Anka but then you have my dad who's like into the Beatles and the Beach Boys but I think at the time just never associated my identity with musicians because I didn't think anyone like me could be a musician that would be famous that isn't classical No, definitely. I mean, part of it is being a child and you're like, oh, this is just how the world works. And then you become an adult and you realize there's all these other factors at play. And like one of those is stereotypes is what we're talking about of like, oh, well, just Asian Americans just don't make music. Like they just don't make popular music in America. You know, that's a stereotype. And one of the other stereotypes that I think has come up a lot, especially in the past year with the Black Lives Matter movement and Asian American hate and what has happened during the COVID era, there's a lot of talk about civil rights for these minority groups. And one of the things that I learned about, I never knew about this, was the model minority myth. And there's a really great article on this website called Learning for Justice that explains this as the model minority myth perpetuates a narrative in which Asian American children are whiz kids or musical geniuses. Within the myth of the model minority, tiger moms force children to work harder and be better than everyone else, while nerdy, effeminate dads hold prestigious but not leadership positions in STEM industries like medicine and accounting. And of course, I knew this was a stereotype, but I think putting it in this light, like the model minority myth is like seeing it in a whole new way of there's so many countries in Asia and there's so many different experiences of immigrants that this is just like a blanket statement for everyone and it blends everyone together and doesn't let people have their roots or their heritage or be individuals. 
Yeah, I mean, I remember learning about that. And I was like, there are things that I like, yeah, there's stereotypes for a reason. Like some stuff that is like, I know my parents worked me really hard to do well in school, but not to be better than everyone else. It's because they just, they didn't want me to have a life like theirs or like have the hardships of when they came to the US. So that's like trying to build me to just have an easier life like everyone else or like what they saw as an easier life. Well, I think part of what you're saying too is it's like the mindset of immigrants is we're coming to America. There's this American dream. You can build yourself up. Like you can build a better life for yourself. And part of that is like if they gave up so much of their livelihood to come to America, they want the best version for you. And then like this is it's just like so crazy like breaking this down because this is how assimilation works of like sometimes parents will even not instill their culture in their children because they're like no we want you to be able to fit in with america yeah i mean i'm very grateful to my parents because they came over here in their like early 20s like early to mid 20s so they pretty much grew up in america like mm -hmm. into the adults you know because i feel like they say 20s is no longer you're still like a baby and now like your 30s is like you're going into adulthood or whatever so they knew some of the things that they were doing were different from their parents just to adapt to being in the U.S. But also they really instilled a lot of the cultural traditions that we have. Like they were really big on speaking to me in Tagalog, which is why I can speak it. And like, you know, those are things that I'm very grateful for that I know I have a a lot of friends are just like know a lot of other Filipinos who didn't have that experience and were just told to speak English. And in the Philippines in general, like for you to immigrate over to America, you have to know how to speak English. Like they mm. won't give you a visa because a lot of the colonization of the country and stuff. So it's something that I'm happy that they have and like they brought over that stuff. But I think that you're right, Jenna, in the sense of like, there's just a lot to unpack as far as like just the model minority myth in general. Yeah. We'll hear it in different conversations with Asian American creatives is that like one of the scariest conversations to have with your parents is to tell them you don't want to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer or in STEM because those are stable jobs and being creative is not necessarily that. And like nine times out of 10, they didn't go into that even if they were a creative coming over because they needed to survive so they needed to get a practical job so like that area is just like weird so first telling my parents i wanted to be a journalist was just like weird <laughs> after that when they realized i was moving towards music journalism they're like wait what does that mean and like it was rough doing that but like it's interesting now even like I talk to them about it and they look at just my experiences of covering the music industry and getting to interview other artists, especially ones they know. And they're just like, oh, this is so cool. Like our yeah. daughter makes money off of words. Who knew you could do that? And I think even if they had some kind of creative bone in their body in that sense, they had to put it away because they needed to build a life here. It feels like for a lot of people, because America is full of immigrants and like, that's the thing. And like, again, this is the thing where it's like white people showed up one day and were like, this is ours now. And they decided that they were in charge and we're going to make all the rules. And, you know, <laughs> as, as we do. And it's just interesting because also just going back to how when you said when you went to England and people were like, no, you're American. And it's like that thing where America tries so hard to kind of make you assimilate to being American and kind of fall in line to that degree that that's why I feel like a lot of Americans, even white Americans, especially in like millennial and younger generations are so stuck on their heritage because they're trying to find a culture when America doesn't seem to have one other than racism and white supremacy, which is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's a thing also where like in certain industries, I've had other Asian friends tell me how it feels like their coworkers are like, oh, but you're basically white because they're kind of viewed as the same intelligence level or like capability level as like the white man is, which I think is ridiculous that like that's what we base things off of. But like there definitely are a lot of people that do view things like that because as Jenna was saying, it's like, oh, like you're docile. You're not a minority in like a scary way, which is ridiculous and just insane when you think about it like that because it's like you're judging people based off of where their family came from 
hundreds of years ago, potentially for some people, especially black people in America, where it's like they don't even know, like, what are you talking about to just like judge them? They're as American as you are, possibly more. They've probably been here longer, you know? And so there are these just so many ridiculous things that pop up that is just like so black and white racism when it comes to like how minorities are viewed in America and the fear of white people becoming the minority is so clear because there have been so many instances where people from different Asian countries have just been completely barred from America or treated like criminals for absolutely no reason. And then once the white man in charge stops viewing them as a problem, it's like, oh, now they are this like quote unquote model minority. They're just fitting in. They've fallen into place. They're doing what we want them to do. And then anytime anybody kind of like steps outside the norm or we let them into an industry that like they're not quote unquote expected to be in they fall into that ethnically ambiguous category where white people look at them and don't know where they've come from and therefore they can like have a career and it's like who made that who (laughs) made that rule and it's just so odd because also it's like white people are deciding who is ethnically ambiguous somehow and I'm like (laughs) also who gave you the authority on that like I don't know how to not find it hilarious when it's just like it just makes absolutely no sense to your point sarah of it's always the double-edged sword of like you're the model minority you're basically white but also if you don't look white there's like this perpetual foreigner syndrome of you're basically white except that you're not so we're not going to give you the same chances or the same representation 100 percent I mean, in the black and white, like what skews, it's like almost like polar opposites, right? And like some people just fall into the middle, especially once you start falling into like mixed race people or like, you know, colorism starts to become like a bigger deal of what's acceptable as do you skew more on the white side or the black side? And I think that also falls into like musicians in general, because there are people who are there and people don't even realize that they're also Filipino or like Asian in general. Like I think there's obviously characteristics for certain Asians that you know where they're from. And then there's others where, especially if they're mixed race, you would never know unless they talked about it. And it's nice now to see that people are less afraid to talk about their full identity and just feel freer to like talk about all of them versus just like what they think the industry or fans will accept because if it's different, than what has been the norm, then no one's gonna listen to their music. Yeah, exactly. And we're gonna get into some specific examples of what you're saying and just how the music industry has actually treated Asians and Asian Americans. Before we get there, I do just wanna give a little bit more historical context. Of course, as we mentioned, there's so many countries in Asia. There's so many different regions and so many different cultures, and there's been a lot of colonization. So there's no way that we can cover a full history, but just to give a few examples of things that happened specifically in America, in 1882, we saw the Chinese Exclusion Act, which basically banned Chinese immigrants from obtaining naturalization for 20 years. And then after that period was over, they straight up just made Chinese citizens not eligible for citizenship at all until 1943. And meanwhile, this was happening. The Chinese population in America was only 0.002%. Like there was no one. This was white people worrying about white racial purity. It was absolutely ridiculous. And then following that in 1942, we have the American internment camps of Japanese Americans, which happened as a result to the Pearl Harbor bombing and President D. Franklin signing an executive order that was intended to prevent espionage on American American shores, but basically 120,000 American citizens of Japanese ancestry were held without due process. So there is a lot of American history of America just being extremely, extremely racist. A lot of it too is that those are two of the big ones, right? And that stuff we may have seen as a sentence in Mm -hmm. books. And obviously like when it comes to World War II and Pearl Harbor, maybe a paragraph on the internment camps. I think now a lot of people are pushing for not just like Asian American history, but just like America being held accountable for all the stuff they've done yep. in the yeah. U.S. to other communities and outside, right? Like everyone says, like, stop focusing on outside, but like even just within us, all the stuff that they've done to people here is already a lot. So it's interesting that I think more people, I would say like, like my goddaughter is 16 and she's learning 
probably more than I knew when I was 16, just because of like social media and just like being more self-aware and things like that, that I think I'm optimistic that people will be slightly better, but I'm a big believer in like knowing what happened before because I think that's the thing is that like people are trying to erase things and letting people die off so that they don't get to say their stories and stuff. This seems to be the issue in America of like we get taught in school so much quote unquote American history, but it's so whitewashed that when there are things that we've done wrong, it gets kind of glazed over where it gets mentioned very shortly unless your teacher is like passionate about that portion yep. of history because they're just yep. allowing the teachers to kind of decide how long things are focused on. And I just think that like it is just insane how much America seems to be okay with just ignoring or turning a blind eye to its own sordid past. Because I mean, when I was, I think 22, I went to Germany for the first time and I was just like shocked. And I went to Berlin. So like Berlin's very liberal in a lot of what they're doing. But I was just like shocked as like how much it felt like people were apologizing and just learning from the fact that the Holocaust happened and that they like allowed the Nazi party to gain power in Germany because for the first time in my whole life when I went to the hostel and they were like oh like what are you planning to do and we're like oh we're going on like a Jewish tour of Berlin and they were like oh are you Jewish and we're like yeah and she was like oh I have some Jewish friends they love this restaurant I was like oh my god I just got I have friends did <laughs> isn't that a weird experience the I have friends <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh my god, what just happened? And it was just like, <laughs> it was just like a very out of body experience. But it was also that thing where to have any Nazi paraphernalia or to say any Nazi slogans or anything, like it's punishable by law. And they're taught in school to like feel bad and feel guilty for what their ancestors most likely took part in and all of this stuff. And it's like, why are we? not taught that in America. That country clearly is trying to heal from a really fucked up thing that they did. And like, I'm not saying that they're perfect. They're not at all. They're still white supremacists amongst them, you know? But at least they're trying. Whereas here, we're kind of like, if we just ignore it long enough, everyone will die and we will forget. And it's like, yeah. that, what? Literally. No. I think part of it is because, you know, they see that if they ignore it, and no one complains about it, then it didn't happen, right? It's like that idea, like if a tree fell in the forest and no one was there to hear, hear it, did it really fall? So it's like, I think that's kind of what they're hoping. I mean, this is in the news right now of like, politicians are trying to stop critical race theory from being allowed to be taught in schools. It's not that the teachers don't want to teach it, it's that there's systems in place that are literally not allowing teachers to teach it. It's that the textbook companies are not even including it in the textbooks. And if teachers care, they have to go out of their way to teach these things. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where things will keep going in a cycle and these things won't end if we don't stop it. And I think one of the issues too, which I know we're going to talk about like people who are mixed race, but I'm just seeing as a trend within the US is that, you know, there are more interracial couples. There are more mixed race babies. There is going to be a lot of conversation about identity in the future. The idea of this like pure race, it will be there, sure, but like there is a growing number of people who are racially ambiguous looking or like whatever it is. And I can say that for Filipinos because since Spain took over the Philippines, like we've been in a way mixed race for a while and that's why we all look different. I feel like there is that hopeful thought that I feel like a lot of younger people have where it's like, oh, eventually it's mostly going to be mixed race. But the white supremacists came out to play when Donald Trump became president and they're not going away. Yep. And so I think that for a while, a lot of white people, a lot of like progressive white people were kind of living in this positivity feedback loop because Obama became president where they're like, look at us, we elected a black man to be president and having that sort of idea where it's like, oh, see the future's moving forward. Look at all these interracial couples and their mixed race babies. And like, that's what the world's going to look like in like 50 years. And it's like, okay, but there's still all these fucking white supremacists that we have to deal with who are going to continue to be like, oh no, the one true Aryan race. And so so I think that it, it kind of plays in part with the whole thing that we've talked about recently in our black fishing episode that I will harp on forever about how like the Kardashians have changed the game for what 
beauty standards are in America and changed it in this way of taking on ethnic body, like added ethnic body parts to their own bodies. And now people are like, oh, if we do this long enough, we'll erase the memory that that came from someone else. And people will always assume that it's from white women when, again, like they're Armenians. So like, I don't know what they would classify themselves as. But you like it's still just like a que- there's still a question mark there. But America likes to. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, oh, it's just so infuriating and exhausting. But we have this thing where it's like we are slowly seeing certain people who have been accepted into the white zeitgeist. I don't know if they're personally trying, but like what they're doing is essentially like erasing parts of other cultures because white people are accepting it into what they can do or what they're supposed to look like. And so everything just gets lost to the point where people are fitting into like the quote unquote Hollywood idea of what a certain race or background is supposed to look like. And so we see people who are Filipino being cast as Spanish people people in tv shows and things and all these other things where even in music when somebody doesn't fit exactly what the white man said they're supposed to look like people are just like well we don't know what they are so we will accept them because it's a question mark and because standards have changed and so i think it's just like there's so much mental gymnastics of being a white man in charge of of a media industry of like accepting what is going to be accepted as xyz role in hollywood because there is that picture perfect idea of the mixed race people kind of taking over america but then there also is those creepy white men working behind the scenes trying to fit people into their categories and so it's like is there ever going to be a happy ending who knows you know I mean, it's so weird because there's this disconnect of what the ideal version of America looks like and then what we're all actually living through. And like for some of us, I mean, especially for white people who have a lot of privilege, it's easy to like just live your life and not think about that. But when you sit down and have these conversations, I mean, well, as a white person, but I'm sure like as an Asian American or as a black American, your experiences are very different. You're dealing with a very different set of circumstances on a daily basis. And so when you look at the reality of it, it's so different than what the quote unquote American dream is. And since we've been talking about mixed race individuals and we keep bringing up Filipina history, I think we should just get into that and get into like the music side of it. Because when you think of who are Asian Americans in music, literally the the only person I can think of is like Steve Aoki and then like Mitski and then like Bruno Mars, who's very like Bruno Mars is very mixed race, racially ambiguous, as we like to say, but he is Filipino. So Emily, I'll give you the floor to share your thoughts there. Yeah. So he's half Filipino and half Puerto Rican, I believe, and born and raised in Hawaii. So like in interviews that I've seen, he usually just says I'm Hawaiian. But like, I think it's really interesting with musicians in general. And like one of the things I noticed as I started to listen to more Asian Americans in music, I started seeing people who wanted to go more into like hip hop or R&B and like that might just what I was exposed to. And then as I mentioned before, like a bunch of people who do like acoustic stuff, but like Growing up, I listened to a lot of like Britpop and a lot of like indie rock and stuff like that. So like, I think the first time I saw Temper Trap and the lead singer is Indonesian, I was like, whoa, are you Filipino? He's like, no, everyone thinks I am. He's either Indonesian or Malaysian. I'm not too sure about that. But like, he was like, everyone thinks I'm Filipino and I'm not, but like, we are same region. But like that whole thing, and it was really nice in a way. And we didn't even have to talk about our Asianness after that, right? But it was just nice to have that connection because it's not something you get to see very often. And then like later on, I, I started to learn more like one of the members of freelance whales he's darren chris's brother and he's also half filipino like there's just like little pockets i started hearing about different artists and stuff and like when i listen to like bands like little dragon naked and famous who are obviously they're more international based but still it's the same concept like their home countries are not necessarily when they say the band's base is not like asia right it's really interesting and like i was like oh cool asian people make music and white people like them and i think that's like a weird twisted thing to me like i think when bruno mars started to blow up and then all of a sudden i was like oh my gosh black and white people like them and that to me was like this is amazing like and i don't even think i ever admitted that out loud by the way (laughs) like 
it was always like, we're never gonna make it. Like, who are we to make it? So it just was very heartening. And obviously like people, especially from the Filipino community were like, yes, like there's someone there. And like, you know, with all the success that he has. And, you know, I think even now that he's like teaming up with Anderson Puck, who's half Korean, it's like a cool mesh. And it's interesting because I'm kind of of the camp that's almost like, even if they're half, I will take it because then yeah, at yeah. least like people will know that we are more than just medical tech and like legal professionals like we do these things too and i think you know like when i started doing music journalism i was very few i remember covering indie music at the time it was like me and two other people i knew who were asian and one of them was from canada so like it was only the three of us that i knew that really covered indie rock in general and it was very weird because i would go to shows and i would clearly see pretty much all white dudes covering indie rock and kind of have this way of acting like do you know anything about it? I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, just because I look like this does not mean I don't know anything. And I think that's the thing. I think that also applies to musicians too. They're going back to that whole idea of like that norm of what you imagine a pop star looking like, what you imagine a rapper to look like, what you imagine an indie rocker to look like, right? And I don't even, definitely do not want to open I will slightly crack the box of K-pop, but like, look at K-pop. Like, we can't even say it's pop music. We gotta call it K-pop. You know what I mean? Like, we have to categorize it because they can't be. Like, BTS is a top 40 group. Blackpink, top 40 group. Twice, top 40. These are all top 40 groups, but yet we will still say they're K-pop, right? And it's not even like, because the K is anything other than Korean. And I think those are the things that are, like, I'm glad they're being accepted, but at the same time, like, you know, they're music too. Like, everyone knows the U.S. market is the market to know that you really made it, regardless if you are from America or you're not from America. I mean, the thing that I keep coming back to as we have more and more discussions about the American music market is that it is both we're American, but also to the globe, it's like we're American, but we're also the global standard for music. So it's like what is being represented in America is supposed to also be what is popular around the world, but it's not being representative of what is popular around the world. And we see this with all the ways that they try to keep out K-pop and they've kept out Latin artists as well for years. And so I think with someone like Bruno Mars, it's like unless you've seen an interview of him talking about it or you Google this, you probably would not know he's half Filipino. You probably would just assume he's black because of the type of music he makes, especially now that he's working with Anderson Pac, who also you would never know is half Korean unless you looked it up. And then we have Olivia Rodrigo, who's half Filipino. Her and Sweetie are also half Filipino. And with Olivia Rodrigo, she has like a Spanish last name. So everyone's like, oh, she's Spanish. But you mentioned this earlier, Emily, that is actually because Spain was colonizing the Philippines. Yeah, so the Philippines is the only Spanish colony in Asia, and we were under Spanish rule for, I think, like three and a half centuries. So that's a lot of time. That's the reason a lot of Filipinos took on Spanish last names. There's a lot of Spanish words in one of the main languages, which is Tagalog. Just the spellings are a little different sometimes. It helps me because I can understand Spanish because of that. But like <laughs> also little things like, you know, why there's a lot of predominantly Catholic people in the Philippines because of Spain. So like they took over that and then that did not end. And then the Philippines had its own like freedom for like a hot second, but not really. And then the U.S. took over and then we became a colony of the U.S. Hence, most Filipinos can speak English because it is actually a lot of, I believe from my family there, a lot of classes are taught in English and then they learn Tagalog or wherever their area is or like their region and like that's the language they also learn the grammar of. But like it's commonplace to be able to speak English whether you're comfortable in it or not. It is crazy that doing research into this and different artists who are making music, who are Asian American, it is crazy just how many of them are in part Filipino because I literally never knew this before. And it's probably a lot to do with the colonization. As you just said, it's so many classes being taught in English as well. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel that, like, at least within the Filipino community, like, a lot of younger people are a bit more open to date outside. 
I feel mm-hmm. like there's going to be a bunch of Filipinos coming at me soon. They'll be like, no, but it is a thing. People, this is how we have her. This is how we have Suidi. This is how we have Olivia Rodrigo and Bruno Mars. Like clearly this is a thing. And one thing that I was surprised with Olivia Rodrigo when I was kind of like just brushing up in one of her interviews, like she talked about being compared to the only other Asian kid in her grade. And that's how the song Jealousy was written because of that. And I think that to me, even though it's like, you might not necessarily fully get that from the lyrics, but just knowing that that was an inspiration and something that I can attach to, like that's really cool. And I think that's something that I really respect about her because she can do that now, right? Like again, like as I was growing up, I didn't really see that. It's kind of sad because I didn't really think about it until like people started asking me like what about other artists or like when i had friends who actually were listening to asian american musicians like and i didn't know any i was like i don't know you know and it was really interesting now it's a lot easier for them to kind of talk about their experience and like saweetie has a song called high maintenance and there's a line about her calling her mom a filipina queen we talked about it before regarding like kind of assimilating it's not that like a lot of people aren't proud of their culture it's just more of being a afraid of not being accepted. And so it's like, it's easier to just fall into the wayside. And that's also the same thing with like the model minority myth about Asians and Asian Americans being quiet and not trying to fight back because we're scared. And like, there is some truth to that to an extent because a lot of them come here from countries that are developing and they just want to be able to survive and just to like build a better life for themselves. Like they don't have time to think about, like it's almost like a luxury to think about critical race theory. No, it absolutely is. You know? Like it hundred percent is. And I mean, that's also evident in what you said about your parents coming to America. When you're a first generation immigrant, your experience or first and second, I would say your experience is going to be so much more different because it is a luxury to think about these things. It is a privilege. I mean, it, just like it's a privilege to be white and not for that to ever even cross your mind because you've never personally experienced it. But it's like you said, your parents just want a better life or your parents are just trying to survive or they're trying to escape something. Like assimilation is so, so crazy. I don't know if either of you, since you've both lived in England, have thoughts on this as compared to England, because from what you've said so far, it sounds like people are able to somewhat assimilate, but still keep their like cultural identity in a way that is very different from how America is. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I think, I, think like, I think that they create their own pockets. So yes. it's like a British Indian person is going to be very different than a person from India, but yeah. they're going to still have those like Indian cultural things. And so they like create these new pockets where it's kind of like, I am British, but also <laughs> I'm this, but like in a very different way than people in America do. And like, yeah, I don't know how I, to explain it. No, I totally agree with you on that. I think like, you know, we could talk about the Indians, Pakistanis, who are the ones who are born and raised in England, I think yeah. they've been able to kind of carve out their own community and their identity. In my experience about being Filipino, first of all, living in Northern England, a lot of people didn't know the Philippines existed. Oh my yeah. gosh. So that's the thing. Or like, I'm the first Filipino they ever met. I've had everything from like, they didn't even call it the Philippines, they called it something else. And then a lot of them thought it was in South America. That was weird. So there was that. But there's also like, I don't meet as many like Filipino British people, but I know there is a community there. And like a good example of that would be like Bia Barubi. She just played New York actually. And like, to me, like I remember interviewing her and I felt like I was getting emotional because she's the person I wanted to find when I was a kid. Yeah. Like she's exactly who I was looking for as a kid. And she wrote the songs that I wanted. Like she's the genre I listened to when I I was trying to hide that I was listening to Pink Floyd and Blur and like, <laughs> you know, because like where I grew up, everyone listened to hip hop and R&B and like, I'm like hidden, bouncing around to tapes of indie rock. So it was almost like, it's interesting that she's so much younger than me, but like, it's as if meeting an idol because she became this symbol for me of like, you know, breaking away from every stereotype of Asian musician, of a Filipino musician. Like she played the music she wanted, she wrote the lyrics she wanted and they were real, you know, it wasn't shy about it. And I love that about her. We talk a lot in like other episodes about how white men essentially stole rock music from black women and black men and how like a lot of black women were at the forefront of what would eventually turn into rock music. But we also have the first ever 
female rock group was started by two Filipino sisters and that band is called Fanny and like they recently I think a lot of people started acknowledging them and being aware of them because they're still making music I think they run a rule of rock sort of situation yeah Um, out of Boston yeah yeah yeah. And so their legacy has been kept alive. And it's this really interesting thing where, like, again, it's America not wanting to admit how much outside forces have inspired music and it's the erasure of important people to the history of rock because the fact that you as a Filipino growing up in America were like unaware of them when you were a kid at least that shouldn't happen like it shouldn't be like oh yeah the runaways shouldn't be like the one thing that everybody thinks about when they think of oh girls being in a rock band starting this whole thing when it's like but there were other people doing it making really incredibly good music that would like hold up today you know in this scene and so I think that essentially people like Mitski or um, Bia Badubi and Japanese Breakfast and these artists doing indie and like rock music and people expecting something else from them I think Mitski said it best in being like I'm a human making human music and if it's inspired by being an Asian American then so be it but that's not at its core I'm just like a human making music that I like and I feel like that's a lot of the story here and like what you were saying earlier about k-pop and like that k being so important even when they're not even all making pop music we had pulled from this article called Asian Americans have never been welcome in music in 2020 that's all about the change which was written on very good light by Beatrice Hazelhurst in 2020 and they had a quote from this Taiwanese American singer called Pinky Square who was saying that music from Asia is growing in the U.S. and that's cool but on the flip side I feel like it's kind of continuing to exoticize Asians as a whole and that really stuck out to me because I feel like at least from conversations that we've had people have with us because we've talked about BTS on the pop charts and that sort of situation of people being kind of accepting of the fact that they're singing in English but also being like their English songs aren't as good they don't have as much meaning they're there's not as much going on there and so I think that there is that expectation to some degree of now that k-pop is so popular of people being like oh it's going to be in Korean and like wanting that or craving that from like Americans I don't think that it's like on purpose but I think it's that whole feeling of accepting something that you're not normally going to accept in some weird way like I don't know how to say it without sounding obnoxious but I think it's like that kind of inherent American need to feel better than everyone else by being like well look at me listening to foreign music or look at me doing this thing and I think that when people see these Asian American artists playing the music that they don't quote unquote expect them to play you do have that theme of coming back of expecting like exoticness from Asians because k-pop is getting more popular and I'm not saying that it's a fault of k-pop it's amazing that k-pop is getting more popular but it's it's that thing where in some degrees I think it could wind up being a detriment to some Asian American musicians who are wanting to perform outside of like what is expected but like again I could just be (laughs) making a mountain out of a molehill you know but yeah, I just think that there's like, there's so many, there's so many levels to it. And I mean, I pulled up the article, like a fine sound of Asian American women in indie rock, which was really interesting because it's almost like if we're going to go with stereotypes, right? There's like the idea of the Asian woman, like whether she's Asian American, whatever. The Asian woman is like docile and like quiet and like a librarian or like whatever it is, right? Like very timid, but indie rock or rock music in general is not that. Right. And so we have all these artists and like, I can't even, I don't even know why I didn't even think about Karen. Oh, and that's the other thing too. Like Karen O, I think last year, especially with all the like stop anti-Asian hate and all of that stuff that was going on that started last year, she posted a photo of her in the t-shirt, the phenomenally Asian t-shirt, which first of all, when I was reading the comments, half of them are like, she's not Asian. Oh my and God. like, actually, on Wikipedia, you see that she's born in Seoul. Like, it's not like a thing. She is half. But in the article, Japanese Breakfast is quoted saying, Karen O was a role model to me because she is also half Korean and is basically everything an Asian parent tells you not to be. And like, while that feels a little bit falling into that model minority myth, but that line, take out Asian, how many parents do not want their kids to be rock stars? Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what race you are. Like. It yeah. 
it just it's that thing where like you're worried about stability and all that stuff and like that stuck out to me too because I was just like it's nice now to be able to reference people now in the industry versus like you know in the case when I reference like be about to be I just didn't have that until that moment but like for Japanese breakfast she got to see it in Karen O and I think that's awesome you know like I think that's why representation matters as cheesy as that line is going to eventually be or like played out whatever it does you know when you see people on stage that you relate to because of culture because of gender because of whatever it is that matters and like as much as I am not gonna knock a white dude on stage like I'm never gonna knock Dave Grohl for being on stage because he's great but at the same time he doesn't look like me so like I can't relate there's something about that that I like seeing now but I know that more of it needs to happen and more of it needs to be accepted you know like I think the thing that's cool about some of the indie rock artists that we've mentioned like Mitski and even there's like Jason and I know Toki Monster is EDM but like a lot of them kind of just like it's not even that like fell under the radar it's just that people were actually just listening to their music and I think that's the cool part about music right like especially with Spotify and stuff you listen to it and you don't see them yet so like it's kind of cool that they've been able to kind of build that and then on stage you're like oh yeah that's not who I expected but it's cool you made that song. I think within the independent music spheres, a lot of these artists like can build themselves up, can build an audience, you know, because we see Mitski, we see Japanese Breakfast, we see these artists. I mean, I even want to throw Hailey Kyoko in here as well. And while some of them may get signs later, there's nothing stopping them from pursuing music and from being part of these communities. As you said, it's like there will be figures within groups where there might be one Asian American person or a few. And so it feels like within indie spheres, Asian American representation is growing in a different way than it is compared to the mainstream. Because within the mainstream, as we've mentioned, there's a lot of half Filipino artists who are viewed as racially ambiguous, viewed as something that's other than Asian. And then we have people who are 100% Asian American who are being told by record labels that they're never going to sell. How can we market you? Like, this is not going to happen. And this happened to Far East Movement, who was the first Asian American group to ever have a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100 in 2010 with Like a G6. And may I just say, I watched this music video back and it like transported me to a very specific time and place. It was wild <laughs> because that song was everywhere. And like at the time, I think I just wasn't paying enough attention to music to know that they were even Asian American. And they grew up in LA. And there's interviews of them talking about how they would talk to record execs and they were like, we don't know how to market you. Like they told them to put on sunglasses in their music video to hide their Asian-ness. And it got to the point where after that hit, they were not going to find success in America. And so they went to Asia to become successful, even though they had never been to Asia before. Like they didn't know anything about the music industries there and ended up building up a career there and then somewhat having success again in America. Somewhat, I say, because not obviously the success they saw with their initial hit. And so... I guess my point being is like, there's also this trend of people who are Asian American who don't necessarily find where they fit in, who end up going back to Asia or back to wherever their parents or, or their grandparents came from. And there's a lot of stories of K-pop idols doing this. They were from America. They went to audition for like K-pop companies and they become K-pop idols. Eric Nam is another one who is from Atlanta, got a degree in like computer science or something like this, was going to work at Deloitte, went to audition on a singing show because he really loved singing and ended up having an entertainer career by accident, but loved making music. And so it's like, like either you're in the indie sphere and that's all you're allowed to be or you have to go back to Asia. That's what it seems like the two options are. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that, like you mentioned that, I also see other weird ways, like one, I wanted to touch on to the indie part two, going into like more of like a South Asian side. Riz Ahmed, right? Known as an actor, now Oscar nominated actor, right? But then like when I see him in interviews, they're like, oh, and you also do music. And like, he's like, yeah, I've actually been a rapper for a long time. Yeah. And like, I remember seeing him with the Sweatshop Boys play Webster Hall. And like, it was so incredible. It was a sold out show and he's so good, but it's like, I was trying to look up their label and it's an indie label 
owned by um, Heems, who was a member of Das Racist and now is part of Sweatshop Boys with Riz Ahmed. So it's almost like the indie route is like your option, right? You'll maybe get signed to a major later. Yeah, once you prove yourself. Yeah, but then going on the another way of entering too is like behind the scenes, right? So if we think of like the Neptunes, Pharrell and Chad Hugo. Chad Hugo is also Filipino and they have produced so many records. They worked with Britney Spears and like all these things. And I have read interviews where Chad was like, I don't mind just being behind the booth. It's fine. I don't need to be like the face, but he's clearly part of that production duo. And then there's another producer called Ill Mind and he got a Grammy because he worked with Beyonce and Jay-Z. Like there are people there, so they exist. It's just that, you know, I don't know what formula people have of this idea of star quality, right? And I do think that now fans do have more power because you know we have streaming services we have social media and like we can like really hype up like the stands are strong for certain people and in the end that's what record labels care about right what their revenue will be so it's just unfortunate that we had to wait this long to even have this conversation now because if i think about it even five years ago if both of you came up to me and say hey let's talk about asian americans and music i'd be like uh okay and I'd have to think about it for a while because I just feel like while it would be more like a lot of explaining and not as much people talking about things. And the fact, Jenna, you mentioned like Far East Movement. I'm sure that people will hear that and they're like taken to a time just like you were taken to a certain time. I think that that is a really interesting point though that you both have made of certain songs like blowing up or like with streaming and stuff where you can listen to music and not know what somebody looks like and that not even playing a part in it and I feel like that has been something that has made music more accessible to a lot of people because it's like nobody not nobody but a lot of people don't care anymore like it doesn't matter what it is but then for some reason once you know it's like you have a new expectation of them so i feel like that's so weird because there have been artists that i'll listen to like they'll come up when i have like shuffle on spotify of like a playlist or something like i'll go off and be like oh radio based off of this artist or whatever and i'll listen to them forever and then i'll be like oh i should go shoot this show and i'm like oh they're all not at all what i thought they were gonna look like or whatever the case is, but like that's never shifted my view. But in reading those interviews specifically with like Mitski and Japanese Breakfast, it feels like I don't know if it's like their fans assuming or if they're assuming, but like there is that assumption one way or another of, oh, they're expecting this like Asian American story when I don't necessarily know if I can give that to them. And I think that that also is part of the woke white generation movement of people being like, oh, you should feel comfortable and safe to talk about your story of being ethnic. And it's like, yeah, it's but like, what if why? I don't want to? Yeah, and then they're like, yeah. but why don't you want to? And it's like that whole same thing of, again, like it accidentally swinging completely back around and you're accidentally like, Ben Shapiroing on somebody that you're no, supposed you to No, you have to tell me. <laughs> exactly what you said, Sarah. Like when you were talking about they're performing and then you think about something they come out with their story, the one band I thought of was the Linda Lindas. I remember when they came out with the song Claudia Kishi when they revamped Babysitter's Club and Moxie was the movie that they were in on Netflix. So I knew about them because of that. But like, you know, when they're in a movie, like you don't know if they're a real band. <laughs> like, yeah. just, whatever. And then all of a sudden they come out with a library performance of Racist Sexist Boy. Yeah. And now they're everywhere because now mm -hmm. there's this like attachment to make them like a thing. And I'm mm -hmm. like... First of all, only half the band is Asian. And secondly, that shouldn't be. I feel like for them, they're punk rockers who are hella young and can play really well. Commend them on their talent. That should be enough. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that was like the one thing that like struck me right away was them. Sarah, you brought up this quote earlier from that publication called The Very Good Light of wanting to exoticize Asian-ness. And it's just like, the Asian American story isn't good enough. Of like, Mateen Japanese Breakfast talking about how like, I just make music. This is my experience as a half Japanese person growing up in America. Is that not enough? Is that not an Asian American story? And it's like, no, you didn't talk yeah. enough about your heritage. You didn't talk enough about being Asian for it to actually be Asian American. Yeah, like, it's like, there what? There were no geisha is... in that story, so I can't hear you. Sorry. Exactly. Like, <laughs> what? 
is an Asian American story, you know? I mean, it's just weird, right? Like, I feel like even Asian Americans ask that of themselves. Yeah. Because we weren't even given the platform to talk about it until more recently. Well, like, in that, like, I think of Eddie Wong and him being a chef and Fresh Off the Boat, which is, like, one of my favorite TV shows ever and interviews he's done about that and the expectation of him because he was, like, super and still is, like, super into hip-hop and that culture. And he's talked a lot about how, like, people were always expecting something of me and then he made Fresh Off the Boat and it's, like, showing this other Asian-American story that people don't really think about because there is that white expectation of what being an Asian-American is and what an Asian story is and all this stuff and it's just interesting because it's like people have multitudes and it depends on who your friends are or where you grew up and what your background is and it's like with him his siblings were like very stereotypical what white people assume of like oh these smart Asian kids and he's like into basketball and hip hop and cooking and food but he was older than them so he didn't grow up in like the same place that they did and I feel like that's a similar thing with these musicians where it's like what you were saying Jenna where it's like they want more because it's the weird stereotypes that Americans know about certain countries where it's like oh people from Paris are rude people from Japan probably their great their great grandma was a geisha like whatever nonsense shit that they're gonna come up with based off of the one thing American culture clung on to of like oh kung fu you know like whatever random thing that American culture decided was the stereotype or the thing that they were intrigued by that came from their country of origin and it's like oh you don't have a story about that do do i care and it's like why does it matter you care about white yeah. people's stories about nonsense like why do you care about other people's stories about like quote unquote nonsense this is so true what you just said of it's like white people can sing about whatever they want they can just sing about love and heartbreak <laughs> but if you're asian american you have to sing about being asian like ah Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's no hook. I don't think there's a really good hook to, like, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Just saying. Like, (laughs) there's, like, like, I don't know. I'm sure people have tried to write songs about what happened with Pearl Harbor and probably did not do well. Like, it's just, sure, I understand cultural context. And I, I love when you hear a lyric and you see that it is something of a social context or like historical or whatever. But that's just because they're a good lyricist, right? Mm-hmm. And like, but let them just make the music they want. Yeah. You know, and it's so shocking too, like how listening to more Asian American artists, like one of the artists I'm listening to right now is Audra Nuna. And she's like Korean American. She's from Jersey too which kind of like because I grew up in Jersey it makes me like feel like oh cool cool people come out of there too and it's funny because if you just looked at her or whatever she presents one way but then if you hear her music she comes off as a hard badass bitch like legit and there's something about it that like she hypes me up when I listen to her but then like you know I'm sure when she walks down the street people aren't thinking that at all so it's like the music is the expected Jersey experience but the outwardness is the expected Asian experience and then when you get the Jersey experience you're like you don't look like Snooki what is happening here the fact that she can carry a crowd and it's just like amazing or like Toki Monster is a DJ and EDM crowds are huge and if you can carry that crowd with just your digital turntable and stuff that is pretty incredible and like really empowering that's what i think people need to expect and i think you know that's where some people get confused with the oh but i don't see color like that's not what anyone's saying no one's saying like please don't look at us for our race like acknowledge that this is our identity but also accept the fact that we might not do what you thought we could do yeah like what i hear is at the end of the day like people are gonna like the music if it's good and like it's very evident because these artists do have followings and because they do sell out shows and they do play festivals people like their music but for some reason it's like marketing people and major labels being like mm, but we can't sell your visual we can't sell your aesthetic we can't sell how you look so we're not gonna invest in you and like i think 
it's changing now. It's one of these things where it's like within our community and within our circles, it feels like there's positive forward momentum. And then you look at like the industry and general America and you look at how things actually play out and you're like, how are you not giving these people more chances? How are you still to this day, like telling them no one's going to buy your music because you look Asian? It's just absolutely ridiculous. It's so frustrating because it's like, is there change happening? Because it's like on the small level, like there is, but yeah. I think it takes a long way to work its way up. Yeah, I mean, I do see, I think it helps when you have people on the inside, right? As people who cover the music and just being music fans, that's one entry point. But like, you know, we talk about label exec, we'll even talk about like managers and publicists. They're their own point of entries, right? And like, if they're still run by the old school status quo, then yeah, then nothing's gonna change. But as we start seeing things like PR companies being run by all women, and then like also women of color, or like you'll start to see label executive positions being held by people of color. I do see it changing slowly. And I think if we're looking at it from the consumer point of view, it'll still be a little hard because consumers are still like, it just depends on the type of consumer you are, right? Are you the top 40 type or are you that music fan who just like really digs deep? And I think it just depends on where you fall on that. And I guess like, you know, the barometer would be, let's look at top 40. Right, let's look at top 40 fans. What are they listening to? Going off of top 40 radio and Sarah coming back again to this quote you mentioned earlier about exoticizing Asian-ness is within top 40 radio, now BTS is being seen on the billboard charts. They're now barely being started to play on radio. And it's like, oh look, there's Asian representation on the charts. And it's like, yes, because Korea spent time, money, and energy building up their music industry. And now it's so massively popular Mm -hmm. that they don't have a choice except to put BTS on the radio. But that is an entirely different scenario and story from representing and supporting Asian American artists where the the music industry in America, the major labels have not spent their time and effort supporting actual Asian American artists to build them up in the same way. And so this is why we're seeing K-pop is now bigger than their own Asian American artists. But I don't think you can compare them because they're entirely different experiences. And to a certain degree, they're different audiences as well so it is interesting that now we can say that we're starting to see representation on top 40 but it's bts who isn't even american yeah 100 percent. there is a reason why korea they're one of the richest countries when it comes to like bringing in money for the creative industries right it's k-pop they have the formula down and while the u.s would like to claim that market they can't that is South Korea's. And you're right, Jenna, like they need to push people or who are here. And until they start realizing that there are artists here or they know it, they're just not putting enough energy behind it. Like I would love to see the day and I wouldn't even say just for Asian artists necessarily, like whether Latino artists, whatever. I want to see the day where we can say, and like, I know that was like shade thrown on like Billie Eilish before, but like how she was like trained and like they really honed in and like mm-hmm. really helped grow her as an artist. Yeah. I want to hear that for an Asian American artist. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, there isn't that care from major labels. People are trying to claim Olivia Rodrigo as an industry plant, so, like, growth. Um. (laughs) No, but if you were touched by Disney, I mean, come on. Like... (laughs) It's like Disney did it, not like, you know what I mean? That's also the thing though, is like Disney didn't even do it. Olivia Rodrigo was like, I don't want Disney up in my music. And Interscope used that Disney fame. And it's just like, it's just funny. It's just like this funny thing where like, obviously I'm joking to be like, oh look, a mixed race Asian American woman's getting called an industry plant success. But like, it, (laughs) it is like that funny thing where she is the first person that I can think of that's not been white that people have been like industry plant but it's also like are you questioning it because of extra things who knows <laughs> so it's just, again so many layers but there is that point of like what Jenna said and what you're saying is like just because k-pop is having success in America doesn't mean that we're having the like <laughs> It's just that thing where it's like, oh, like we filled the quota, and it's like they're not, am- yeah. they're not fucking American. Not the same thing. Like it's yeah. amazing that they're having success and that we're doing this, but like they're not fucking American. That's not the point. That's not what people are trying to do. And like I saw this, I think it was a Twitter thread that I thought was 
quite interesting that was about Monoskin and their success in America and about how they won Eurovision and then they've like had all this success in Italy and they're the first Italian band to have like a number one in America but their number one is a cover of an American song that's been (laughs) successfully covered throughout time and so it's like if you listen to their discography All of their songs that they've written themselves that are in English are very sexual. I'm not saying that is a problem, but their songs in Italian are like very beautiful, have a lot of meaning, have a lot of substance to them. And then their songs in English are just kind of like very sexy, which like the band themselves, like that's their whole vibe. But I do think it's interesting that they're getting obviously like they they work with Gucci in Italy but they're getting that Gucci stuff also in America so they're getting invited to like Gucci parties they're getting to like rub elbows with these other famous white people all off the back of a cover of an English song made by English people from like I think the 60s or maybe 70s like is going viral on TikTok is like what really sparked the American interest in them and yet even with bts it's like bts is getting thrown on through like the before show of the grammys when they are nominated for a grammy it's not aired during the live show all these things they're like getting tacked on for like the numbers but they're not getting those invites they're not getting that thing that they crave and yet america's like look we have asian representation and it's like it's not asian american representation number one but also you're kind of like making them the goodie bag because you know their fans are going to show up and then you see this other foreign band having success in like a very different way And it's like, I'm not faulting them. Like, I love Monoskin and I think that it's amazing, but I'm also just like, they're white. So it just all feels kind of (laughs) sus. Well, I mean, one thing that you touched on was the difference between like with BTS, they're Asian and then there's Asian Americans and like Mm -hmm. people just kind of lump everyone together in one boat. And it's like that differential is like huge too. Like when we do think about it, lucky that they got bruno mars and like olivia rodrigo on top 40 because there's their asian american you know what i mean it almost is kind of like a lucky strike right or they're like we check the box oh shoot like we got it but it's like people aren't seeing the nuance and it's just like there is a whole different thing because i thought of when you were talking about that um sarah was like crazy rich asians where they're like actually majority of the cast was from asia they were mm-hmm. not asian american it was just really aquafina and constance Wu, technically so it's just like well is it really asian american representation yeah. i mean sure like with the main character but like it inherently it was a story that was based in singapore it's just so funny the amount of hoops that america will jump through to to like not give people not actually give people representation but also to claim it as their win because it's like it is a win to have a full stacked asian cast but to claim it as an asian american win for white people to claim it as an asian american win to be like oh look like pat themselves on the back for it it's like what are you doing when like the asian people having the conversations are like this is amazing but it's just a really tiny step and then these white people are like look what we gave them yeah like like, this is exactly what happened with shang chi and here's like an asian story for you and then they gave it to asia and asia was like what do you want us to do with this like (laughs) this isn't ours like (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's like it's one of those things where it's almost like we're seeing it probably like slowly picking up in movies but it really went from zero it felt it feels like it went from zero to 60 right but also like the discourse around Shang Chi was how people were saying how like in Asia like Simu Liu was not like the ideal yeah. look or whatever, and some guy was like, "Oh, everyone here looks like that," and I was like, "Buy me a one way ticket to wherever you're from if everyone looks like Simu Liu. Like sign me the fuck up. <laughs> like what are you? Like and I'm like, I don't care. Like if you're telling me that if that's what every man looks like, and then your guys like." standard for beauty is like beautiful effeminate men like if the men look like that and then the really hot men look like that like great (laughs) just like what's the problem here and it was just so funny because they were like trying it felt like they were 
were trying to make it like controversial and this whole thing and it's like just because maybe the American beauty standard is different it's like shouldn't you be happy but also the whole point of a superhero is that they are an every man and like everybody's supposed to see themselves in the superhero which is like a whole other conversation but I just thought it was so funny that they were trying to make this like a controversial decision when it's like it's an Asian American film but Disney doesn't want to acknowledge that it's an Asian American film and therefore Asia is upset which is understandable but I'm also like you're telling me that everyone looks like him (laughs) (laughs) I mean I'm very curious to see like um so like there's this anime called Cowboy Bebop and they're making like a real real life action version of it and that person's gonna be John Cho that's I guess in my mind closer to what I see as like Asians in Asia that's like what essentially an anti-hero or like a star would look like but it's just like interesting to see it on screen and it's very visual and then like we go back to music it's still like hard because it's like at least when you're watching a movie if you're like i don't want to watch asians on the screen then you can just be like turn that off right but like it's almost I think Sarah, you mentioned it where you like listen to it and then they see them live and then they expect something and that's not what they yeah. expected. And then they're like, now they're turned off. But you liked this song before. Yeah. So yeah. did you like, what was the change? So like, there's so much layered on here. Yeah, there's so many avenues. And I think, I don't know. It's just the thing like you mentioned with Don Cho being in Cowboy Bebop, like that is also a very clearly handsome man who like should have been given leading man standard forever and you just have these things where it's like america doesn't want to admit maybe that they find these people handsome and i'm like finally maybe he's whatever like given that spotlight but it's even that same thing in music where we keep talking about how a lot of the asian representation in asian american music is mixed race and so it's again maybe like that comfort in knowing that a white person was involved to some degree And so it's just always that thing where it's like there are so many fucking caveats to it and it's so unnecessary when like it's just like there's talent why does it matter why do we have to do this stuff and uh, i just i can't personally wrap my mind around it i mean my final thought is like sarah when you were just saying that it's like if there's whiteness in it or if there's blackness in it we're more familiar with it and therefore we're more comfortable and it's the exact thing you were talking about earlier how you felt this like super personal connection to like Biba Doobie because you had similar backgrounds you had similar experiences or you wish she could have been there when you were younger it's like that relation factor of Asia and Asian Americans seem so far different from what the general America is used to that they can relate to it in no way and I think that's where like that marketing aspect comes into it's like oh if they're mixed race it's like well they're kind of white looking or like they're kind of black looking and we're familiar with that so we can handle it so that's my final thought so i mean with all of this being said and all of this talking about like the caveats to it and just the different layers involved i mean from your perspective of also like there is like that pigeonholing and the expectations and all that have you felt like there is change because these people are having success or do you just feel like it's kind of people like we're saying like passing it off and being like oh look like three people in this community are doing something well that's fine that's enough what do you think the future holds for this and like do you think that there is potential for people to stop being like there's no room in here for them when there clearly is room for them um i think this falls into like every other thing regarding race right like until a system decides to change or is broken and then build back up again it's the only way we're going to really see like significant change i think i've said this before but like i am a little optimistic partially because you know as i start seeing the people who are the players in the game or the decision makers right they're starting to change i'm not saying that's gonna be like all okay in the next like five years or whatever but i also think that you know with time and with new artists and like just giving people more chances especially those within the asian american community on a bigger scale not even like indie tours like full on unless they wanted to do indie Mm -hmm. like if they want to go into a major label like them having that opportunity i think they're more open to it now than they were before but there's still a lot a long way to go and i think that's not just the record labels part to play i think it's also the fans i think music fans in general need to start opening their horizons and consider listening to like other types of music or not other types of music but just like you know can only listen to certain songs all the time 
this is what Spotify is made for or Apple Music or like whatever streaming service you ever want to use. This is why they exist, is because we can click on a thing called Shuffle and they can just give us a bunch of songs that we've never heard of before. And I think like on their end, you know, if you, there's someone you like and they're like, whoa, this is not what I expected, maybe do a mini deep dive on like who they are and then you'll start to like find out more about them. I think we're at a point now where everything is available to us, so we don't necessarily need the record labels to always be the one to be like the be all end all. But I think that the industry is changing and it's getting better, but like less than a baby step. So maybe like baby creep. No, I completely agree with, with your thoughts there. And I think one of the reasons why we love this podcast, we love having these conversations is because these conversations help us think more critically about this. They help us open our horizons and, you know, kind of, help the next generation be the change that we want to be seeing. And this was a really great conversation, a really great learning opportunity for all of us. So Emily, I wanted to give a big thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. And we're going to have all of like your social links and links to your work listed in the description below. So any of our listeners want to go check out more of your work, they'll be able to do that. I love when friends come on the podcast. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Also smart people. Smart people who are our friends. I know. I love that now I can brag about my smart friend who came on our podcast. Exactly. Um, that was a really insightful conversation. It's just like nice when like you have run of the mill conversations with your friends about certain things and then you get to bring them on your podcast and have it more in depth and learn new things about a person you really care about, but also a subject that's really important just in general to the music industry, but also to them. And so I just think that overall, I learned a lot today, even though we read so much for this, I feel like I learned even more somehow. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's always, I mean, we can do as much research as we are able to, but it's always different having someone who can share their lived experiences. Yeah. And I think also just like the discussion format, just in general of like existing, <laughs> where it's like having the conversation about something you read, I think unlocks more things because then mm -hmm. you can tie it back to other information that you have from past learnings or lived life or whatever. And especially with a topic like as big as this, there's so much else there once you actually start talking about it rather than just reading it. Um, and that's why school exists. <laughs> <laughs> you just describe school. You read something for homework and then just you talk about it in school. class. <laughs> Welcome to the school, school of Name Three Songs. But it's also like, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing. Because yep. we, like that's the one thing that's been really fun. It's like the comments when people are like, oh, like, it's really fun learning with you. And I'm like, that's the goal. That's the want. Is people knowing that like we are learning and discussing and then they're learning with us and feel like they're discussing with... I don't know. I just love it. It's so fun. <laughs> but no, that, that was a very insightful conversation and I think we brought a lot of topics to light that I think a lot of people have been thinking about and discussing lately in one way or another so I mean for our listeners and to extend this conversation off to you guys to have with us or with each other the same sort of question that I had for Emily is it's like what do we think the future is for more inclusiveness in just like the American pop culture zeitgeist because it's like how Emily was saying for her when she was a kid in America it was like oh white and black people are famous and doing music and people that look like me aren't and that's just how America is and then how I was saying how like at some point with so many Hispanic immigrants and that it's like that also became part of it with Latina music being more prevalent in America and that look of a human being like quote unquote more accepted into the pop culture zeitgeist especially within music and so it's like how do we include all these other people that are American and like what do we think the future is going to be for this like do we think that it's going to continue being like oh well we've checked the box with K-pop when like they're not Asian American or do we think that because the younger generations are becoming more knowledgeable do we think it's going to change i'm really curious to hear your guys thoughts on that so if you would like to discuss that with us you can come hit us up on instagram or twitter we are at name three songs or as always if you have any personal beef with anything we said or really liked anything we said you can come talk to us personally i'm at sarah underscore Fagan and jenna is at jenna underscore million so thanks for joining us this week on name three songs until next time never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band <laughs> <laughs>
And remember, you're never too cool to listen to Mitski. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out and leave us a five-star review. They really help. If you want to find out more about any of the sources we referenced in this episode, you can visit namethroughsongs.com. 